Eileen, welcome. Thank you for having me. On the level of neurology, how do psychoacoustics directly affect how we feel? Psychoacoustics is a great field that we're learning more and more about each day. And we do know that certain sounds, certain harmonies, certain melodies, certain frequencies can actually have great healing potential in our bodies, great calming potential, but also can be irritating. And so it really does depend upon the individual and the sound actually, and where the sound comes from. In fact, we do know from some research that sound that comes from a telephone, an iPhone, telephone, we don't use telephones anymore. <laughs> a cellular phone versus a radio versus ambient music um, versus live music. So on a, like an acoustic guitar, a piano actually has different frequencies that is received by the body. And so there's a lot of variables that go into the science of psychoacoustics. In fact, there are some that are using tuning forks actually as means of healing, of music, of sound healing, I should say, sound healing with, with tuning forks. And tuning forks actually hold different frequencies as well. You know, conventionally, neurologists use tuning forks to s assess for vibratory sens sensation. So, but it's also got sound. And in fact, we do testing to sort of assess bone conduction versus air conduction. And I think that's a really important component with regards to how our brain and our auditory pathways receive sound. So I think that there is great potential in psychoacoustics, and I'm actually excited over where the research is going. You, you mentioned the, the iPhone, the telephone. Th these are kind of the everyday sounds that are in our lives for better or for worse. And so how do we do a better job of connecting to our everyday sounds that we experience? Which sounds should we embrace should we seek more out of should we be aware of and what sounds should we try to minimize in our lives i love this question because i think that our world is just too noisy right i don't think that we even i think most of us don't even know what true silence sounds like no pun intended i think that we are living in a society where there's ambient sound that we no longer register but our brain does and our body does and our soul does and our mind does. There is ambient sound that is always around us, especially if you live in a city, of course, and that seems obvious. But even if you live outside of cities, you know, the suburban areas and uh, even some rural areas, because there are in industries out in rural areas that may not be close to someone's home, but they're, they are far enough, close enough, I should say, not, too, not far enough away where that ambient sound isn't picked up by our very sensitive nervous system, which has, you know, these tendrils uh, that will pick up sensations and sensory stimuli from all around our environment. And so I think that we have to work hard to try to find those pockets of silence where we can find them if we can. And then I think we have to select what kind of sound we want to be exposed to. And so that's why I generally recommend that, you know, there are certain, there's music, of course. Now, we all like different types of music, and I think that speaks a little bit to our own individual preferences in terms of what sounds good to us, and I think that's something that we should honor. But we do know that certain um, meditative kinds of musics are very calming and very healing and can counteract some of the noise of our ambient environments from just our modern culture. So before we go to music, I want to stay on our everyday noise, if you will, okay. noise, sound, I live in Dumbo and we've got the Manhattan yeah. Bridge over us yeah. and there is a subway that goes over it and it can often be very loud. And I've lived here for coming up on, wow, 14 years, no, 13 years, 13 years, 13 years. I'm used to it. If you live in a city, noise is just the cost of living in a city. What advice do you have for someone like me who has noise do you embrace it do you try to minimize it what do you do if you're me and you've got a subway that goes over your head every 15 minutes you have to take breaks from it you really do and whether that means you have to travel somewhere to take a break or sometimes people you can wear headphones even without sound coming through them you have to block the sound you no longer register it but it still is present and your body registers it that i can assure you your body feels not only obviously with subways, it's not only the sound, but the vibration, right? So 
your body is feeling that shaking of the ground on which you walk. And it's, you know, if you're barefoot, you know, all those peripheral nerves and will pick up all that vibratory sense and send it through your spinal cord, through the vibration pathways. And that has, uh, over time, certainly can have effects on your overall nervous system and your level of, of tolerance, of your level of patience, even your mood. And so it's not only the sound in this in that case, it's the vibration that the subway causes. I mean, I'm a New Yorker, so I speak, I speak, I know this. And so it's really important that you find ways of taking break. And if on a regular basis, you can just decide to wear headphones. Obviously, you can insulate your place of living as best as you can, um, but there's really no avoiding it. And while you might think you've gotten used to it, your body does not get used to it. It does not like it in general. And so have to take breaks and, you know, and it doesn't have to be a big, you know, exotic vacation somewhere. It could be you just sort of drive upstate to, you know, to the Adirondacks, you know, somewhere out and just be in nature. And in fact, there's a lot of science behind the healing effects of nature. And I think it's got to do with the silence, frankly. And I think it's got to do with the sounds of nature. I think that's part of the healing part of nature, in addition to obviously the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide and all of the other benefits, but it's got to do with the sound. There's a certain silence and a certain acoustic quality of just being immersed in a natural setting that is really healing for a lot of what ails us, a lot of the inflammation of our brain, a lot of the inflammation of our bodies. You know, it affects our mood, our level of anxiety, our energy states, uh, our cognitive states. Co actually, exposure to nature has been shown to have benefits on cognition. So I can't stress how important it is to really find yourself in nature, at least on a regular basis. And I think that how often, so the frequency of that can be different person to person, but it has to be done. It has to be done. Well, the, the good news is for, for me personally and Dumbo is there's a beautiful park so I can escape from the subway over my head and go to the beautiful <laughs> park and get in nature. So coming back to the healing power of sound, and obviously, as you stated, the sounds in nature are very healing. And then there's the music, you know, every, everyone's got a, a playlist they, they go to when they're feeling blue right. or they're looking to, to get into a certain mood, to relax, to do what, or to focus or to get some energy or wind down, what have you. I'm curious what, on a personal level, I'm curious what you go to when you're looking to, you know, whether it's like you're looking to relax or, or looking for a pick me up and then, and then two, how should we be thinking about music? and the role it plays with regards to, you know, setting the stage for healing or for just giving us a boost. So personally, I, you know, I do think that there's a level of sentiment that comes with music, right? We all remember the music from when we were growing up. And so I tend to sort of, you know, go back to the seventies and the music of the seventies. And I think that there's some, you know, I don't know, there's, when you think about what was comforting to you at younger ages, sometimes it, it provides some comfort at older ages. And so I definitely prefer that kind of music, but my go-to when I want to relax, when I want to meditate is I have a particular album that I just play over and over again. And it's basically Meditation for Sleep. That's the name of the album. And, and it's just a very calming, and there are about 40 tracks on it, but every track is of the same frequency and has uh, very calming sounds, mostly of nature. There's water sounds, there's bird sounds, there's wind sound. And so that is sort of my go-to when I meditate. And it really does work for me, frankly. It, it, I mean, it's almost at this point, it's almost like Pavlov's dogs. The minute I hear the, those, those tracks, I immediately sort of got, go into a deeper state. So that's what I do personally. And I do think it's important to recognize that it's different for each person. And, you know, music holds just great therapeutic potential. I think that, you know, I, my, my daughter's a musician, so I always hesitate to sort of talk about, you know, <laughs> the hard rock and what it can do to a body and rank because likes that kind of music. And I know that lots of people do. So I don't, I'm not looking to offend people's tastes on, on any level, but I think that the potential of healing from music is held in different states with different genres of music. And so, but I do think that things that are calming are things that have a particular, that help induce certain waveforms of our electrical activity to our brain specifically. Like, you know, there, there are some that help to induce alpha waveforms, which are more of a calm awake state, theta waveforms, which have been associated with drowsiness, but are sort of in that transitional state between awake and sleep, which I think is a really interesting state to be in. Um, 
And then, of course, there are those that help induce, you know, more like delta kind of sleep waves. But then there are those that can induce a beta wave, frankly, which is a little bit more of a hyperactive kind of brain activity. So I think that it's important that we pick musics that allow us to sort of, you know, center ourselves and sort of dive deeper into a, a level of consciousness where we can actually find uh, our healing potential. And, and that sounds a little woo, perhaps, but there, but there, there really is truth in that. And when you get to that spot, you know what I mean, is what I like to say. Like when you're there, you feel it. It's not like a question, like, am I here or not? You're, you know that you're there. No, I, I love that. And I think like anything in health and well-being, whether it comes down to, to diet or exercise, listen to your body, how do you feel? And, and, I, and I think it goes for music as well. On a personal level, you know, my go-to when I'm ever, I'm trying to like wind down or a little stressed. And I've tried to integrate this in the bedtime for our two little girls, Claire DeLoon, Debussy, I think, Debussy, I don't know how you pronounce it, but like that, that always kind of like cal calms me. And then girl, I was a huge grateful, huge deadhead, grateful dead fan. So, and we bid you good night. It's like always a nice wind down for me. And I've tried to integrate that into our daughter's bedtime routine, but right now they're preferring Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star yeah. by Jewel. Jewel, do, Jewel does a great <laughs> cover of Twinkle, Twinkle. Yeah. See, her voice is actually that perfect kind of, of tone that really does induce that kind of state. Absolutely. I mean, there are some singers that have that tone to their voice. Okay. Wait. you got to share. you got to share. Give us some singers who I, have that. What's the wave we're looking for again to, to, to take us well, down? The wave that we're looking for is a specific tone that it can induce a wave. And the, the, yes. my favorite wave for this state of healing is the theta wave. But um, yeah, I wish you were good. I knew I, I was ready with some names because I'm really not good at names. My daughter would she goes to Interlochen Academy of the Arts and she's in the singer songwriter program. She would be like mortified if she knew her mother couldn't come up with names of singers. So how about this? You come <laughs> back, we'll put it in the show notes for our listeners, but we got Ju Jewel is one of them. Jewel qualifies. Jewel is definitely one of them. Yeah, for sure. And then there's like Alison Krauss as she's, she's got a beautiful voice there. Oh, I could see their faces. I just can't come up with their names as I will ask. Them all, all good. We'll put them in the show notes. So, so coming back to the trend of sound. You know, much of the trend explores the emergence of AI, artificial intelligence powered soundscapes. Right. And so now you've got, you know, startups using personalized data, like, heart, you know, I'm wearing different, but you know, as I wear my whoop, my Fitbit and my, my aura, you know, measuring everything from heart rate, circadian rhythms, natural lighting, et cetera, to create a unique sound experience that can prompt that desired state, you know, whether it's sleep or winding down or focus. So can you share a little bit about how this works on a neurological level? I think the way a lot of this works, and I, I don't, I'm not an expert in the AI forum, frankly. I think that going, you know, trying to do things a little bit more, more of an, of an using less electronical, electronic kind of devices to try to induce these kinds of states, I think sometimes sort of works against the ultimate goal. But sure. I think a lot of these programs that have come out are actually remarkably helpful. And, I, and for patients who don't know how to meditate, I, I generally recommend a lot of these apps that are out there that really help to, that are designed to help patients find a, a meditative state by using, of course, um, certain music patterns. And I think that they are useful for those who are beginning at it. But as you get deeper and you get a little bit more sort of used to sort of knowing what your body needs, I don't know how much can be provided by, by some of the AI offerings that are out there. So, but I, they work to basically simulate what certain music patterns and music frequencies and mu music tones can do for you. And, and, you know, but I think I, I, in a, I don't know how varied that they can be, frankly, that would be tailored to a particular individual. So I, I don't really do a whole lot of AI other than to, for patients who are new at it and trying to really learn how best they can incorporate that into their lives to find a, a more calm state to, to live in, basically. So do you see a world where more doctors are prescribing sound? as part of their healing protocol. And like, I'm curious in your practice, like, what does that look like today? If someone comes in, it's like, all right, you know, we're, we're cutting out the sugar. We're gonna get you meditating and I'm prescribing a 45 minutes of Juul. <laughs> uh, I do see a world of it. So I think in the integrated world, we regularly include things that are non-pharmacologic. I know I certainly do. And it, it is, I, it, I always recommend meditation and I, for sure, 
recommend using sound to help you with meditation. And I used to actually give out CDs that had certain meditative music on it because I believe in the power of music and the power of sound to help. But people no longer have CD players. So, I don't, so they just download them or they use these AI things. So I think that there is a great potential going forward in medicine where integrative approaches include certainly sound therapy, music therapy. I mean, music therapy is being used in hospitals now. So it, I think it's, a, it's becoming a lot more mainstream, though not fast enough. And certainly, you know, not in enough places, but in some places they are using music therapy as a, as an ancillary treatment for patients, um, especially in the hospitals. I mean, so in fact, one of the local hospitals here has like a music room where they bring patients in and someone plays the piano and uh, it's called music therapy. It's a music therapy session. So I do think that there's great potential coming on the horizon for more music therapy, more sound therapy. I'm curious in your own practice, or maybe it's anecdotal from colleagues, can you, have you ever seen incredible results from sound where, where you've said, oh, wow, like this really made a difference in this, in this patient? I've certainly seen incredible results when it comes to the ability of the patient to find a way to meditate and then help with their healing. I, and it's usually done as part of a program. So I have, I've yet to see where where sound alone can induce enough healing. I, I mean, again, you know, I think that neurological disease, neurological symptoms and imbalance of our neurology, I think can be so complex that I, I never think it's just one thing that's going to help. Uh, and that doesn't mean I, I always include medications, but I think that it's a, an overall lifestyle approach that includes sound therapy. And I think that's what's important. So there's no, you know, I don't regularly say just, you know, go off and listen to you know, some music, I, I'd say, listen to music and here's what else you need to do. But I do think it's a very critical component of the way we live our lives and largely because of all the, of all the noise of our environments. So going back to neurology, I think it's binaural beats, if I'm pronouncing that right. It's suggested they synchronize different areas of the brain and in some studies are proven to boost memory and focus. What, what's your take? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that the science has suggested it's not as robust yet as it needs to be, but I think it will be soon, where it does show that it really helps to focus on tasks and improves cognition. And I think because when you sort of synchronize the hemispheres a little bit, I mean, we're so distracted these days that, I mean, we're all multitasking and we're distracted by electronic noises, you know, beeps and little, you know, tones of, you know, messages coming through and texts coming through and the phone is ringing. That parts of our brain are distracted and why we all find it a little bit harder these days to multitask effectively. In fact, some research suggests that you can no longer multitask effectively. So there's some research that with the binaural beats that if you can synchronize the hemispheres a little bit more, you stabilize their connection and they are connected actually. And therefore your the pieces of the brain are not as easily distracted. And so you can focus better and focusing better actually improves cognition. So it's, you know, it's the focus and attention that's important. In fact, when patients often are concerned about cognitive, you know, decline, it's usually because they're not able to focus as much. And when we get them to focus as much, then cognitively, they seem to be back on par. And we do this with testing, with validated cognitive testing. We can see this change when we work on their focus and attention. And binaural beats is one way to do it, certainly. The research suggests that's what it will help to do. And again, it's just our modern world. We're so distractible these days. I mean, I think, you know, ADD is on the rise in, my, in the adults. And so I, I think it's important to try as best as we can to whatever we can do to help focus. And music does that as well. Sound does that as well. It really, if you can focus in on the music playing and think of nothing but the music, just like we say, think of nothing but the breath sometimes when we're meditating, sometimes when music is playing and you think of nothing but the music and of the sound and the tone and the harmony and the frequency, then you very easily, you cut out the rest of the world and become very focused and that improves cognition. So you're leading me to think about developers, coders, you know, my, one of my co-founders and CTOs, Tim, you know, loves Daft Punk, loves Ratatat, would put on his, you know, headphones and you know, just get in the groove and just get in his flow. And that's almost like you've heard that or seen that it's almost a little bit of a stereotype where people code, they put on their headphones, they listen to their music and they just go, they're in the flow and the, and they're blissfully doing really incredible things over the course of, you know, days on end without interruption. 
Is there something to that type of music? Yes. Without question, there is. You know, the, it, that's a really interesting story because that's another interesting point that I, I think I find so intriguing, which is that sometimes it almost doesn't matter what the sound is, but if that's the only sound in your headphones, for example, or in your background, you can focus better on a task, which is why a lot of people say that they're so productive in coffee shops because they drown out the background you know, chatter, which is really what it is. And then they are able to focus on their task at hand because it'll, it, again, they're bringing their brain around to the, to what they have to accomplish. And the, the sounds around them are just drowned out in the back. And so they are able to shut off parts of their brain and put the rest of their brain towards that task. And so that's a very intriguing component of sound and its, uh, and its effect on our health and on our cognition specifically. And I, I actually find that myself sometimes. I mean, I've written quite a few articles sitting in coffee shops where clearly it's not silent. And sometimes when I'm at home and I'm working, I put on background music that's usually of my taste. Like I said, like I like the seventies, but, and it really does help me focus on, on what I have to get done. So there is that intriguing aspect about sound in general, but it's meant to help you focus and it's not particularly a healing modality, but you know, I think you can argue that it does help with cognition because you get to focus a little more intently. Something, something you hear is, you know, I, I, people have like a playlist for X or Y, and you touched on this earlier where it may be tied to, you know, your teenage years or a memory. And it's, you know, for example, you know, 25 years ago when I played basketball, you know, there would be a song I would listen to, to get me ready. I'm curious from a neurological perspective, how much of that is me just telling me telling myself the story, you know, being superstitious for like, this is the song I need to listen to, to get in my routine. Or you have some players, you know, they have the same meal over and over. It's part of the routine. It's almost superstitious versus is there something neurologically that's happening and does, is it the repetition or am I just playing a trick on myself? What does neurology say about that? So we do associate certain music types with certain events of our lives and certain either successes or failures or certain times of, you know, maybe we were happy in that time of our lives, or maybe we miss a particular time of our lives. We, there are associations for sure. I mean, I'm sure you listen to songs that bring you right back to high school. You listen to songs that maybe bring you to when you met your wife or, you know, your wedding song brings you back to that day of bliss. And so we do make associations. And I think that there's something very emotional and tender about that, that does help us process emotions, frankly. I mean, I have patients who will tell me that they cry at certain songs because it reminds them of a particular sad event. And that is very few therapeutic on some level. And that is part of the limbic system. And we do have to process memories. And this takes us to a whole other topic that I know is not the scope of this conversation, but it's an important topic nonetheless that I'll just touch upon, which is that, you know, things like PTSD and sad, you know, traumatic events, sad events and things of our lives that we don't process appropriately will affect our cellular machinery and will affect our neurology. And, and I only bring it up in the sense of, in terms of the scope of this conversation, music can sometimes help us do that. So when we play songs that bring us back to a certain time, they do have certain healing potential in the sense that they help us process some of, of these underlying emotions that might still be present that might be affecting our health. So I think, that, again, I think this topic is a lot more complex than people make it sound. People just think, oh, just listen to some music. There's a lot to it. And when you understand what goes into the neurological system and what goes into our overall health and well-being, I mean, it's very complex. And that's sort of what I do. These I, mean, I see a lot of complex and chronically ill patients, and I sort of see all of these things just intertwined and playing a role. And so I, I think it's, I think it's, an, I think these are important topics to really explore in depth at, at some point, maybe we can, but it's important. So anyway, so that's, I know that's a long-winded answer to your question, but I think that is the, the, the potential of listening to music that brings you back to a certain time. It does have some therapeutic potential. So a lot of the conversation is focused on the potential of sound, the potential of music as a, as a tool in our health and well-being toolkit. And I'm curious, is there a study out there where you looked at it and said, oh, wow, this is really c compelling. Or is there a study you would love to see happen? I'm curious, what's your take on the science today and, and where right. it's going? So 
it's a really good question. So there are a lot of very small studies, some, you know, a little bit anecdotal. There aren't, you know, in medicine and in science in general, we like randomized control trials. And these are very large studies, usually costly and hard to do, frankly. Uh, I would love to, see, and there are none of those in, on this particular topic. I would love to see one of those, just to answer that part of your question. I would love to gather, you know, that they're expensive. And so, you know, you need to get funds, you need so, but that's what would be perfect because then we can really prove in a way that's unassailable, frankly, about the potential of sound and healing and health. You know, right now there are some small studies or some articles written. There's, you know, testimonials, accounts of benefits from certain sound therapeutic modalities. But I don't think it's enough to really sway enough of the medical and scientific community into incorporating it more regularly, I should say. I mean, I don't think that anyone would argue with the fact that sound clearly plays a role in how we feel because every single one of us can feel happy or sad based on the song we're listening to. So, but to incorporate it into sort of more wellness plans, I think we really need a lot more research. Well, is there a small study you thought was particularly interesting and would like to see done on a larger scale? Not in a protocol that I would like to see, frankly. I think it has to be a little bit more comprehensive. You need like a control group in order to really prove the conclusions, frankly. Because like I said, it, like a, it's very complex and it's very, you know, there's lots of variables that can confound issues. And so there have been none that have been done with a true control group, right? So that if you didn't use this intervention, did you not see that outcome kind of thing? Got or at it. least I haven't seen it. I mean, to be fair, I haven't read every study out there. So. Sure. I certainly don't want to act like I know them all out there, but from what I've read. Got it. I'm curious if you could wave your ma magic wand and, and get funding tomorrow and everyone lined up to participate. Is there something specific or now that you would love to do? Yeah, I would love a, a large number of participants. You know, it wouldn't have to be hundreds, but, you know, at least a good amount of, you know, maybe even like a, a group of a control group of 25 and then a non-control group of 20, you know, an intervention group of 25. And then where they have some, there are similar concerns with regards to whether it's, you know, cognition or mood disorder, um, insomnia, so those kinds of things that I think are particularly useful to use sound therapy for. And then we were to intervene with a particular sound therapy modality, whether it was particular music or even the tuning fork, as I discussed, there are ways of using that by neural beats. And then we would have an intervention group and a non-intervention group. And then we would do, you know, pre and post questionnaires and exams. And I think that would be the best way to at least a proof of concept idea to sort of show like, look, there really is pet potential here. Well... As a parent who has two little kids who have trouble sleeping, I think we could get a group of parents to sign up <laughs> and their little kids and that we can prescribe Jewel singing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star to see if our children successfully sleep. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a bad night last night, bad night last night. Oh, I'm sorry. How old are your girl? Almost five and two and a half. Wow. And, and now they're in bunk beds. So if like, oh. <laughs> which is super cute, but like if one of them is having a bad night than the other yeah. one, you know, otherwise in the past you'd be like, ah, oh, you know, work it out. You'll be fine. But now they just disrupt everyone. But at any rate, it gets it, much better. I promise. I, I, it, the, the, we're, we're very blessed. They're healthy and happy and they're, they're very cute kids. I'm sure. And they love music. So in closing, where do you think this field is going? Like, what, what do you think we're going to be talking about in the next few years with regards to sound and its power to heal? I think that the, all of our senses are going to be utilized a lot more in terms of healing. And I think sound in particular holds great promise because there are so many different ways of that we can incorporate sound in healing programs. So I think it's going to be, I, you know, I would say in the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot more research, certainly a lot more studies being done on sound therapy and a lot more um, sound therapy being incorporated into treatment plans and having more patient responses and patient experience, which over time can actually, you can have a, a large, you know, clinical set of clinical data just from patients' own experiences. And you can publish case series even, you know, which can be useful as well. So I think, so I think there's going to be a lot on the horizon with regard to sound therapy. And I'm excited about it, frankly. I use it, reg I use it regularly for myself, for my family, for my patients. So I'm just excited to do it. Well, we are super excited as well. Eileen, thank you so much. You're so welcome. It was nice talking to you.